So here's a few news stories. Um, this one's pretty interesting. CERN has been testing the, um, the standard model. And they don't have a nice graph here, although it was in a video they had. But there's six kinds of quarks. And there are a couple of big outstanding issues in cosmology. One of them is um, a huge one, which is why there is so much matter and so little antimatter on Earth or in the universe. Uh, because the underlying laws of physics seem to be symmetric, and it's not clear why that would happen. And another one is, what is all the dark matter that causes the universe to not expand faster than it does? A large portion of the matter is made out of some kind of substance we've not found yet. And they've found an asymmetry in how the, I think, the charmed quark decays, or, or collides. Yeah, um... The beauty quarks. They collide the beauty quarks and they turn into K mesons, but they turn into an unusual amount of electrons compared to muons. So anyway, the point is they're, uh, they're very close to proving this. The standard is um, they have to get the statistics down to one part in three million of chance, and they've now got it down to one part in one million of chance. So they seem to have found the fundamental asymmetry, and that suggests that there may be a missing fundamental force or a missing fundamental particle in the standard model, and both of those could lead to all sorts of exciting things, like some new form of energy, some new forms of matter, and such. So it's a pretty exciting finding, and they've been chasing it for years, and they're getting very close to it. <coughs> So Trump says he's going to make his own Twitter or some similar social network, uh, but nobody cares, which is, I think, quite correct. Um, you know, the Trump Organization was famous for not being able to actually execute anything. If you know the Gartner's uh, Magic Quadrant, they create a company by completeness of vision and ability to execute. And Trump talks big, but he never actually does anything. And he isn't actually able to organize anything or hire competent people or anything. That's why normally what he does is just license his name to be used by somebody else to put on a building or steaks or milkshakes or something. And uh, if he's actually going to make a media thing, people just expect it to be a total flop, even his supporters. If he was to partner with somebody like Parler or Gab, where somebody else made the platform and he was like the guest, that might work. Didn't they have to exercise Stephen Milley's dad? The woman did, in fact, bring in like an exorcist or uh, somebody like that to uh, burn sage or something to clean the room. Yeah, that's the way she felt. Because Stephen Miller was pretty vile. He was pretty much uh, one of the most extreme Nazis there, the one that pushed all the extreme racial cruelty. <clears throat> Although it's totally caught on with all the popular Republicans now, we should bet on how long before his own social media gets hacked. Well, yes, absolutely. I would expect it to be fabulously insecure in addition to poorly made in other ways and not have anybody in it. You know, that's what I would expect. That's usually what happens. People say, oh, I could make Facebook. And they say, yeah, I bet you think you could make Facebook. And when you actually try, you're going to find out it's not so easy as you think it is. Anyway, uh, so Putin got the vaccine. Uh, it was kind of hilarious that he didn't get the vaccine uh, earlier, showing a lack of confidence in the Russian vaccine. But um, that actually is not surprising because the way they got the vaccine out fast, Russia was number one, was by skipping phase three trials, which, by the way, is not necessarily entirely stupid. You know, we had the vaccine a year before we could actually get it, and we spent a whole year testing it. And you could argue that when you have such a pandemic killing people, you ought to rush it out without bothering all that, and that's what they did in Russia. But anyway, he got the vaccine, although nobody knows quite which vaccine he got. Anyway... So everybody is moving to renewables incredibly fast. I'm, I'm glad to see it. Even the coal mining firm is now moving into solar energy and closing mines. That's what I thought. You know, one of Trump's campaign's promises was he was going to bring back coal mining jobs. And the thing they said is even the coal companies don't want you to. The fact is nobody really wants coal anymore. The market is small. The alternative energies are cheaper. Coal is just on the way out whether you like it or not which is a good thing because coal really pollutes a lot and you really don't want people using coal. China's going to have electric cars, a rival to Tesla. They already have some and they're going to have more. The Zeker is the Chinese uh, electric car to compete with Tesla. So we'll see what comes of that. Might be, uh, might be a good alternative. I don't know. I don't think you can buy Chinese cars here. 
But I know you can buy Japanese cars and stuff. I don't know why you couldn't buy Chinese cars here. But as far as I know, I've never heard of anybody doing it. Maybe there's no agreement to export them or something, but it would seem logical. And so this was kind of cute. Um, I didn't entirely understand this, but I think I got the point. What he did on a Windows machine, I think this, yeah, this is a Windows machine with drive C. He made a directory with dot dot in the name. And therefore, when he goes to that directory, he's really going to the directory above it. Does that mean we have to sell our data to get the Chinese car? Well, it probably does. They probably like that. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> so now he was able to take a signed Google document and somehow mix it up so that this digital signature applies to the signed Google document, but it's attached to that file because it's actually in a different directory. He was somehow able to confuse it on the path of who had signed it. So now he can create something which is totally not from Google, but which appears to have a Google signature when checked in Windows. So that's kind of cute through, um, through somehow confusing the signature verification process. This is far from the first time this sort of thing has happened. Um, an early version of Internet Explorer would actually not check the whole certificate chain. So you could just sign it by another one step up and not actually go to a real root authority and it would accept it. So these signature verifications often have flaws, as, we, as we've seen. And the last thing, right on my web page, I found this group, Learning Thursdays. And I put it on my web page. Might be fun. Every Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific time, they have some kind of uh, training with these guys. So. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to tune into this, and I recommend you folks try tuning into them. They're worth extra credit. This one is hacking. This one is memory forensics, then exploiting Jira. And this looks fine. The Red Team Village has got a good reputation. they got good stuff. And uh, so that's a regular event. It might be worth checking out. Anyway, so today we're up to more Android. <coughs> So we're down to Android Implementation Part 2, and I'll get it. I think, as usual, I don't have it open anymore because I exported the update. And it's that one there, okay. All right. So we've been through that stuff. Uh, we were in exploiting devices. Now we're going to finish exploiting devices, uh, or get further through exploiting devices. Is my more coming for next chapter. So, um, all right. So here's some physical attacks. If you have physical access to the phone you're attacking, for example, if you're a cop and you impound a phone at a crime scene, you're trying to look at it. Now the problem is it'll probably be locked. So now you've got a lock screen like this, and you don't know the pin. So there's ways. Now you'd like to get a shell access would be one way to do it. One option is USB debugging. If USB debugging is turned on and it's not on by default, although we have it on by default on our Jenny Motion emulator because it's just a testing product, um, then you could connect a cable and, uh, and connect to it with ADB, and that would be pretty easy. Um, but if the screen is locked, this doesn't get you past that. Now, there is a bug in early versions of Android <coughs> that if you go to the emergency dialer, you can get to the USB debugging authorization. Because when you plug it in, it'll pop up a box on the phone saying, do you want to allow USB debugging? And that box will pop up even on a locked phone. So you can say OK, and then get USB debugging. They fixed that, but that's a pretty serious flaw. Um, all right. And then there's a file here that contains the ADB privileges. That's this RO secure. Uh, if it's zero, then um, ADB daemon runs as root. Otherwise, it runs as the shell user. This determines how much privilege you get if you do get an ADB shell. And of course, on our Jenny Motion emulators, we've got it set so ADB debugging is turned on and it's running as root, which is certainly not the way a production device should be shipped. It should only be that way if the user has been lowering the security for some reason on their own device which used to be pretty common because people would put on custom ROMs, and it's probably not that common anymore for Android devices. So anyway, now, um, in modern versions of Android, you cannot even run ADB daemon as root, even if you turn on that 
parameter because it's compiled in a way that it won't run as root. You'd have to have a recompiled version of ADB and daemon and overwrite the binary on the device to do it. Now, these unlocked bootloaders are how you would restore the firmware on a bricked phone. And uh, I, I think I bricked one of my iPhones trying to jailbreak it earlier today. So I'm kind of going to be in the mood for doing one of these on my iPhone if I figure out how. But anyway, this is a fairly common thing when doing hardware hacking. You mess with the firmware, you foul it up, and there has to be some way to recover from that. So you hold down certain keys while booting on the phone, turning on the phone, and then you get into some kind of uh, limited environment that you can use to replace the firmware. And so you can flash or boot a custom image. Now we can't do that with our simulated phones that we're running in Jenny Motion, but you can do it with a real phone, and you often have to do that. And I remember when I started uh, hacking routers, you get used to having to do this pretty often if something goes wrong while you're uploading firmware. So you can now, um, now if you do this, you unlock the bootloader and that forces a factory reset and wipes all user data. And this is the idea that if somebody uses this technique to get in your phone, they can't get your personal data. But you could do it and put on a custom ROM and then use the phone and leave it unlocked. And that's um, the same thing with iPhones. If you've unlocked your Android, or you've, or you've jailbroken your iPhone, then it's a lot more vulnerable to people who attack it using these kind of tools. So if they left it unlocked, then you can just boot into a special ROM and get a root shell. Uh, this is the equivalent of just booting a normal Windows machine from like a CD running Linux to get the ability to read things. Um, all right, so if uh, you can also use, you can have an app. If there's an app on the device that has the disable key guard permission, then that app can remove the lock screen. So if you could trick somebody into installing malware on their phone, you could perhaps unlock it through the malware. Um, and you can do it with a Drozer agent, because Drozer is, of course, just like Metasploit, it makes Android malware. So this is how you create a Drozer agent with that ability. And then you can uh, disable KeyGuard here with this run post perform disable three from a, from a, a uh, Drozer shell. All right. Another thing you can do is you can delete the key files. The, the pattern lock uses gesture.key and the password lock or pin uses password.key. And if you delete those files, it has no screen lock anymore. So that's one option. You can also, by the way, crack the encryption of these things quite easily. I used to have that as an extra credit project in here. I'm not sure if I left it in, but it's not that hard to crack these because there aren't that many possibilities for, say, a four digit pin. All right. Uh, so you can remove these key files, but in order to remove them, you have to be system or root. They are read-write only by system. So uh, as Microsoft would say, this is not a realistic attack scenario. If you already have root on the phone, then why do you need to further hack into it? You already own it. All right. And so here's an intent from any context in any shell that would unlock the phone. You could just use this... Um, particular intent, starting this intent to choose lock generic, that would turn up. So that's a flaw on earlier versions of Android, but then they patched that. And here's uh, one of the snarky articles at that time pointing this out. There's a bug in here, choose lock generic class. You can use it to choose the type of lock mechanism, and you can change it to none at any time. So any row gap can at any time remove all existing locks. Um, and by the way, uh, this was in early versions of the iPhone, it was the same. The early versions of iPhone didn't have user accounts. Everything just ran as root all the time. But there was no App Store at that time, and everything running on the phone was supposed to be what Apple put there, so it was not as bad as you might think. Anyway. All right, so, and this is one, there's a ton of ways to get past like this, where basically kids are good at finding these. They just mess with the phone. Try everything. Try emergency call. Try this and that. Send it a phone call. Send it a message through the ICMS app and find some way to disable the lock screen. This turns out to happen very often on phones. So on the Motorola Droid, all you had to do was phone it and press the back button and you get back to the normal desktop. Um, Viber was an app and you could place the call and again if you answer the call which happens when it's locked then go back a bunch of times and you escape the lock screen. Um, all right 
Now, in early versions of Android, Android 4 and earlier, you could just put in the wrong PIN five times, and then it would just let you unlock it with your Google account. So if you have somebody's Google credentials, you can get in their phone. Now, that is no longer true for modern versions of Android. Now, they turned that off for modern versions, and what you have to do is you have to sign up for this thing called Android Device Manager, and then you can unlock the phone from a website, but it will erase all the user data because they're trying to stop people from using this to get people's data off their phone. All right. And so those are physical attacks where you have your hands on the device. And then there's some remote attacks. Uh, now, of course, the greatest remote exploit is where you send data over the Internet and hack into the phone. And so ways to do that would be to um, send someone a jar that they put on the phone, um, trick, start a Drozer agent somehow by busy install packages, or um, loading a Drozer jar, a couple ways to do this. So the most tactical method to put something on the phone is, of course, to find memory corruption. And this is what we're exploiting in the exploit development class. If you have um, buffer overflows or heap overflows or format string vulnerabilities or any of those things in the code, in the binary level, then you can actually inject commands that execute on the phone. But of course, those are becoming rarer. The browser is becoming more secure than it used to be. Um, the third-party tools put on the phone by the manufacturer, not by Google, are more likely to have flaws. So this Polaris PDF viewer was pre-installed on some devices, and that had a stack-based buffer overflow. So you could just, if you get someone to open a malicious document, which shouldn't be too hard because the whole reason they have this thing is to open documents, then that app can uh, get unauthorized commands, and the app has installed packages permission too, so it can now install malware on the phone. Um, so that's one way. Um, if you have a web view using JavaScript interface, which we've talked about before, then it's subject to code execution flows. And this can then uh, use the permissions of the browser. The browser then becomes sort of like Drozer. It's an app you can use to execute commands within a certain context on the phone. And uh, there's this uh, WebView exploit, it's in Metasploit, in fact, used this exploit against older versions of Android. It's right in Metasploit, and there's a blog where someone shows how to do it right from Metasploit if you have an older phone. Um, you exploit it here, and you have these settings. Uh, local. This will just start a listening shell on the phone, so you get about the same thing you have if you do the project that we did a couple weeks ago where you put malware in some commercial app and put that on the phone, and now you get a Metasploit shell, an interpreter shell on the phone. Uh, there was an Exynos driver, whatever Exynos is, I've heard of this, had a vulnerability. And so you can exploit it. Drozer has a module just for it. Um, and this will try to abuse the map device operation. Uh, it's risky. It may crash the phone. This is true of the dirty cow exploit on Linux, too. That's funny. The first time we did the um, pen testing competition in Rochester, my team went there and they found a dirty cow vulnerability on a server and they told them, whatever you do, don't crash this server. And they learned the hard way that there are two dirty cow exploits. One of them kills the device half the time and the other doesn't. They used the wrong one and they killed the one server they weren't supposed to kill. Such That's one thing about pen testing. Uh, there are risks. Anyway, um, all right. So uh, to keep access on your phone after you get in, then you could install a special SU binary Normally, SU, when you, elevate to, when you elevate to root, it will pop up a box on the screen asking the user, this app wants to escalate to root, is that okay? But you can put an SU binary that doesn't alert the user. And that would be something you'd want if you want to have remote control of the device in a covert manner. And of course, we talked about man-in-the-middle exploits. You can get in the middle of the network traffic by doing things like art poisoning or using burp or by hosting a wireless network with your own hacked router or any a variety of ways, you get the traffic to pass through your device. And then you can alter it if SSL is not working correctly. Now, the whole point of SSL, or really more properly TLS, is that everything's encrypted with a key that's only known by the legitimate server. So you can't read or alter anything. But as you know, frequently, um, that is not being enforced by the app. And if you really want to break into real TLS, which is what companies do to man in the middle traffic, then you have to get um, a root CA certificate. And law enforcement agents can do this, nation states can do this, and people that basically can bribe the so-called trusted CAs 
into breaking that trust and selling you a root certificate can do it. And it is an open secret that that happens pretty often. It's not something an average hacker could do. How secure is TLS 2 versus TLS 3? Um, it's, it's not 2 and 3. It's 1.2 and 1.3, I think, is where we are. And um, for all practical purposes, they're all quite secure. The main improvement is from 1.0 and I think 1.1 up to 1.2, it has perfect forward secrecy. So uh, one point, oh sure, you really, you can use any of them for business unless you're like uh, trying to commit crimes. But the, the point is the uh, National Security Agency in America has a gigantic data center in Utah where they're archiving all the internet traffic for years. And the point of that is because TLS 1.0 and 1.1 use the same key for many sessions. So they could archive it, and then if they're able to break the key like five years later, they can go back and decrypt all that old traffic. And TLS 1.2 and 1.3 fix that problem. So every session uses a different key. That's called forward secrecy. So even if somebody steals a key later, they can't come back and decrypt the old traffic. That's the only major feature. So I mean, now I, that's why everybody, because of the Snowden revelations, exposing the fact that the NSA was attacking American companies as if they were adversaries and hacking into them, everybody immediately jumped up to 1.2 and 1.3. So uh, that, like most major security disasters, it scared everybody and made them move forward. So almost everybody is now using TLS 1.2 or 1.3, like my website. Uh, I don't know if you can tell what I'm using here. Uh, you can tell what the certificate is, but I don't suppose it's easy to tell which version of TLS I have. But I think everybody is now using TLS 1.2 or 1.3, and that's fine. But really, there's nothing terribly wrong with 1.0 or 1.1 either. That was the only flaw that really caught much attention. It's a very good question. Now, SSL is just not secure. You don't want to use that at all. But any version of TLS is probably good enough for most people. Anyway, let's take a look at Kahoot. Uh, I'll get those up. I thought I, oh, that's right, I accidentally closed everything. All right. This is 8B. Yep, and there it is right at the top. Makes sense because the last one I modified. like that shit. All right, which one of these will delete all the user's data? in the bootloader. We're good. All right. What permission allows an app to unlock the phone?
All right, disable key guard. All right, what systems let a website unlock your phone? Should be one system. Anyway, that's Android Device Manager. You can sign up for that and then you can use it to get in your phone if you forget your password, but it will wipe your data now. All right, what's the most technical type of attack? That's memory corruption, like we're doing in 127. You really have to read binary and assembly code, and most people find that pretty off-putting. All right, Felipe. And Turtle, we'll have to tell me who they are. If they care about the points, and that may or may not be a real name. Probably not. It's vaccine, anyway. A turtle. Okay, good. I know who turtle is anyway. All right. And that's interesting. They got something new, or I probably hit a button. Anyway. All right. Well, I'm going to stop.